Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another interview based episode of the Optimized Muslim podcast. This was recorded alhamdulillah on Friday the 17th of April 2020 and you'll find it's a quite a wide ranging conversation in relation to our well-being and productivity through these times. It took on a bit of a different direction than I anticipated, but I think you'll benefit from that as we discussed the nuance involved in advising people and how the pressure to be productive is not perhaps suitable advice for all. A quick note on current plans for the project inshallah. A lot more content which you'll find here and on the YouTube channel. I've also set up a Patreon account and you can contact me to book coaching sessions details of which can be found on the website. So introducing the guest for this episode, brother Martin discovered Islam through his search for self-improvement. He was inspired by Islam's teaching that amongst others promote spiritual, social, physical and mental health. After converting to Islam in 2011, he didn't see much of what was being preached actually being practiced within the Muslim community. So combining his own hands-on knowledge from competitive bodybuilding, which was pre-Islam, years of personal training and coaching experience and a medical background, he felt the need to launch Muslim Fit, which you can find at www.muslimfit.com. Without further delay, here's our conversation. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Optimized Muslim Podcast. Today we're having a conversation with Brother Martin from Holland and we're going to be discussing mental and physical health and productivity uh, in relation to coping in this coronavirus situation. Most people are spending a lot more time at home and obviously we want to maximize that time, be productive and leading into Ramadan, that's especially important. So we're going to start the conversation now. With uh, Brother Martin, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How's everything going for you in Holland with the coronavirus? Yeah, um, well, basically, it's weird. I think that's mm. the best description. Uh, alhamdulillah, me, neither any close family members have been affected by the coronavirus. Mm. So that's a strange thing is that you hear a lot, uh, but you don't see it. Yeah. Um, you're just sitting at home doing, uh, <laughs> not going to work. So, I think the best description is weird uh, mm. and not ideal. It's not I know. Uh, something. I agree. But when when do you think it kind of really hit for you that this is actually something serious? And what's the rough numbers in Holland anyway in terms of fatalities? Do you know? Uh, yes, I think we are somewhere in the. Two and a half thousand now. Two so, and a half thousand cases. Yeah. Okay. Uh, death. So, mm. um, of course, less than the UK, but we also uh, only have se- 17 million people. Mm. So a lot less. But um, yeah, the, the, well, at first uh, there was a big scare because uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, ICU beds. Yeah. places available, but they scaled it up. And at the moment, the, the healthcare system is, is coping. Mm. Um, they they think they had their peak now. Uh, on the other side, now the discussion starts about the, the one and a half meters uh, society. Uh, mm. And now it's been sinking. Okay, because it's not like it's not like it's going to be over in two weeks and everything's everything's going back to normal. Uh, what our government is telling us now is that um, normal is going to take a while. It's going to take a long time. So. Even when schools back, go back open, university opens again and people can go to the office, uh, even then it will be very gradual uh, and it won't be the same straight away. So I think for me at least, then it started to really come in for, okay, this is, this is going to take a while. This is not just to uh, sit at home for three months and then it's done. Mm. Okay, so in terms of how people around you or the coaching clients or the other Muslims in particular that you're interacting with, um, how do you think they've, now that it's been a few weeks since the whole lockdown situation has uh, started, how do you think they're managing the isolation or working from home or being productive at home? Yeah, good question. Uh, What I noticed in the beginning, and I still... I still hear it, but for fewer people, um, is that a lot of people uh, 
everybody walks around with ideas in their head. Okay, I want to do this and this and this, but I don't have the time because of work, because of this and that. Um, and now when we are in lockdown and not all, but a lot of the most people are at home, uh, all of a sudden, uh, in theory, you have the time. So I've noticed that a, so many people told it to me that it couldn't be a, a coincidence anymore, that so many people were disappointed uh, in their performance because now all of a sudden they had the time to do the things they said for a while they wanted to do and mm. now they had the time they still didn't do it yeah that's a that's a strange one really and i know we briefly discussed it before we started recording but i kind of experienced that very quickly in the first few days and i'm going to ask you what you think the main reason for that is because i think um for me i think it's a lack of constraints I realized in the first couple of days that I was probably even less, I was still working um, from home in terms of the actual, my actual job. But I realized that I was actually more productive when we weren't working from home in terms of waking up earlier, going to the gym, everything was kind of time orientated. Whereas because you've just given this freedom of the whole day, if you're not used to working by yourself, um, it kind of takes away that structure. And I think that can lead people down um, to being more, being less productive. What do you think about that? Yeah, you're, you're, I think you're totally right because, um, yeah, too much freedom is, it doesn't help you, really. Uh, I think you can see it, you also see it back in our religion is um, we have prayers on set mm. times. And mm. even when for some prayers there's a window, we are encouraged to pray them on a uh, on a time. And basically, if you wouldn't have, if we didn't have that, those times, probably a lot of people uh, won't do it. Not because yeah. we don't want to, but because daily life gets us uh, distracted. Um, mm. So Marcella, yeah. people really need uh, rhythms, uh, regular regularity. Uh, a plan and normally for example when i work with clients and i want to improve their health or their productivity um, we we can do small changes that have a big impact mm. but now everything changed we have a lot mm. of constraints it's a totally new situation um, i think everybody deals with a a form of stress and it's not so much a stress as we're maybe scared of being sick but it can be financial stress just the the, the fact that it's there's uncertainty we don't know when we go can go back to our workplace to our normal life we don't mm. know how our normal life is going to look after the lockdown um we had uh, our ramadan is going to look totally different so also we don't have our normal interactions we can we are limited to do the things that we like so even when th those, those things might not feel like a big stress, it's not like a deep-rooted fear, we cannot ignore those things and they're going to have an impact on our uh, yeah, mental abilities because it is an impact. It is a, a form of stress, maybe not really intense, but it does distract you. So, Yeah, you can call it a cognitive drain, I think, because yeah. it's still taking your mental bandwidth, so to speak. Because you're, even if it's at the back of your mind, um, it's going to affect people, like you said, in different ways. But let's talk about it from the perspective of people who maybe haven't got the financial stress. Obviously, everyone's got it to an extent, but I mean, um, they're not worried about it on a very serious level. And they're still kind of trying to be productive and, and focus on getting things done. Um and I think you mentioned a good point about how we have set prayer times in the deen. They act as anchors throughout the day. Yeah. And if you even set your time around that, it gives you some form of structure. Um, but the next point, I think, what do you think about, obviously it depends what people want to do, because some people are going to see this as an opportunity for growth, perhaps. Extra time, let's learn some new skills that we didn't learn before. I've recently been... Um, upgrading my kind of video editing skills and whatnot but then there's going to be other people who are going to use it as an excuse perhaps um, because oh there's so much uncertainty there's so much stress and obviously what, what do you think about that how to 
because we can't say if someone is suffering from stress in relation to this then everyone needs to be really productive and all the rest of it but I think there's an element there where some people will kind of justify it to themselves um, that due to what's going on they don't need to perhaps push themselves um, like they would normally yeah yeah I understand um yeah, it's a really difficult question because there are people that might need a push in the back mm. and motivation, but um, it's funny enough because there's a lot of talk about millennials, that we're lazy, that we uh, cannot work hard and those kind of things. But if you look at science, just statistics, is that, for example, if we look at our current generation, we score very high on perfectionism uh, and actually opposite to what, for example, Simon Sinek claims, we also um, score quite high on impulse control. Mm. Um, I think that we live in a society currently that with, with the social, with Instagram and, and, and Snapchat and all those kinds of uh social media as we live in a society that has, that puts up very high expectations for everybody mm. just put it qu simply everybody has to be uh, very well uh, very uh, have to, you have to be rich you have to have a lot of friends you have to go on twice on vacation every year you have to be muscular you have to be perfect basically mm. so um we set very high unrealistic expectations so i'm always a little bit um hesitant to really push people uh, to work harder because not because it's not needed but mostly because we get it we already get it a lot people know mm -hmm. they have to work hard i think the biggest problem is is that a lot of us don't have realistic uh, expectations and we don't analyze our situation because you mm -hmm. said like this this coronavirus it affects people differently like we mm -hmm. talked about our in our uh, pre-interview uh, talk is that uh, personally, I really, I get a lot of energy uh, when I connect with people physically, you know, mm, that's yeah. why I always worked in the coaching field, in the healthcare. I, all my work, what I've done professionally uh, and as a hobby is always involved working with people. Mm. So now all of a sudden being in a, in a social uh, isolation, social distancing, it hits me quite hard and maybe somebody who is less social not in a negative way but just doesn't uh, doesn't have that basic need uh, to be so social all the time they yeah. will probably notice it less so i think a first part is bring up some empathy uh, and empathy is not the same as um self-pity mm. empathy is basically if you see somebody who's in trouble or you want to help mm. him and self-empathy yeah. is acknowledging that you have problems uh, and mm. everybody and everybody has problems and everybody needs help sometime. If you have self-pity, and a lot of people have self-pity, is that they believe that they're the only ones with this problem. And mm. I see this so many times that, especially in my coaching, people say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm unproductive, I feel ashamed. And they always think that they're the only people around them that deal with those problems. And when I tell them that basically I and all the other clients deal with the same problems, they are so... Mm so um surprised so just acknowledge that this is a very difficult situation and some mm. people might be emotionally uh or just worldly financially more affected than others so the first step is to acknowledge reality how much am i being affected by this uh, and how am i going to deal with this situation before you're going to set those uh goals because i think it's really important to make use of this time but we have to be realistic to be productive. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. But I was um, obviously this kind of podcast is more going to be received by those who are already on that wavelength of yeah. taking action and being productive. It's more to do with uh, giving the practical advice as well, alongside yeah. the deeper kind of um, points, practical advice as to how people can perhaps um, change habits or install new habits because this is a time where because the whole routines change yeah obviously routine oftentimes habits are stacked on routines yeah makes things easier when you've been given a somewhat of a blank slate 
you've got an opportunity to either create good positive habits or create bad destructive habits in a way. Um, so say, let's give somewhat of a case scenario. How, say if um, I'm, I have someone that has been working from home for the last three weeks um, and I'm just feeling unproductive or I've realised that working from home and spending all this time has not actually led me to do what I thought I would do if I had the free time, right? What advice would you um, give me in, in terms of changing my day-to-day? -day? Let's say if we're going to be in lockdown for another three weeks yeah. or another month or so, where in terms of practical steps, where do you think um, someone should start? Yeah, well, like you said, this is a podcast really focused on self-development. So I agree that most people who will listen to this probably already have the drive to improve themselves. Mm. So especially in that case, my first point would be uh, accept that this situation is difficult because it means that um, it's normal that you don't have your normal productivity. So that's step one. Just accept the reality. Because mm. if you don't accept it, you get you and you plan too optimistic. Uh, a lot of people, when they don't succeed, they have this all or nothing mentality. So mm. when it's 11 o'clock in the morning and they haven't uh, finished what they scheduled right, okay, this day is, I'm unproductive today and let's just quit and play video games. So first step is make a really accept reality and give yourself room to grow back into the rhythm because mm. it's new. You have to grow into it. Don't mm. be too harsh on yourself. Um, after that, um, yeah, it's really important to make a routine and not only plan in your work, but plan in movement, relaxation and entertainment. Mm. Because um, when we look at studies done uh, at work, uh, working from home, they call it ta uh, tailor work in the in the in the research field, they've looked at teleworkers that work from home and they saw that they work, they tend to work longer hours, take less breaks and work more intense. Mm. The, the caveat is that, of course, those studies were done not in the coronavirus lockdown, but people who uh, chose uh, to work from home. So that's different, of course. But mm. I think it's a real danger because Normally, you would be distracted maybe by a colleague who comes in and asks you a question. Uh, you have your coffee breaks uh, yeah. with your colleagues. So you have a lot of... Uh, during the day, you have social interaction. Um, you have to physically move to go to the, the, the canteen or something. Yeah. And all those things fall away. So uh, we tend to be... We, we tend to put our agenda full of work, mm. but we forget to plan in our relaxation and why that is important because um, at first you need relaxation and entertainment you cannot it's impossible to just work for 12 hours straight yeah um, if you don't what I see is a lot of people um, when you don't plan it you will eventually lose concentration and start fiddling or scrolling Facebook and those kinds of things and yeah. if you don't plan it uh, basically what happens you lose concentration and then you feel guilty that you've been scrolling Facebook for the last 20 minutes. Exactly. And even when, and even when you, it was a relaxation, it was an entertainment, but was it really that fun? No. So you haven't enjoyed it and you feel guilty. Yeah. I think that's where it comes into taking that agency to actually control. I've got a video called Mental Diet. And that's where that comes into it. Because if you've been feeding yourself social media, I know before you talked about um, expectations and that's part of it because if you've been feeding yourself this kind of Instagram and um, Facebook and just comparing yourself in a negative way right it can shake your metrics in terms of what you feel is important as a Muslim if you yeah. believe certain things are uh, what we should be striving for everyone gets that sense especially in like a spiritual month like Ramadan they feel that connection at least for a while but then as the year as the as the year goes on people lose that they start seeing their friend posing with the new car or whatever else and then it kind of shifts their metrics or their goals towards more dunyawi things right and then yeah. i feel like in terms of 
practical steps that people can take. I know one thing that I've used is first, like you said, set a clear intention and plan and then plan out the things, actions for the things that you feel are important in your life that are going to take you closer to your goals and values. Because there's a saying that if you don't fill your time with your high value priorities, then your low value priorities are automatically going to take over. You know how you said that you'll find yourself on Facebook and then feel guilty afterwards that you didn't even enjoy how you spent the time. And in terms of practical, there's, for example, you can get app blockers, right? Yeah. Or you can put your phone in a different room. Um, for me, I use a, I put my, I might put my mobile in a different room. And there's also these app blockers that you can use that allow you to perhaps um block maybe seven or eight applications like the social media ones but the rest of your phone what you might need for work or whatever else or reading or kindle or um, podcasts you can still allow that and then initially it can feel you can see as um because your brain's used to that kind of stimulation initially you might feel the difference but if you just bear with it for maybe a day or two then you overcome it and it becomes your new normal. Um, yeah. So I think that's quite important, th those kinds of um, strategies. And then, like you said, if you just start small, um, you, you're not going to completely transform your day in in one kind of, in one thought, so to speak. Yeah. Is that um, psychologist Jordan Peterson, he talks about negotiating with yourself and designing a day that you would be proud of, but also including periods of rest or entertainment like you said um and then you kind of do a deal with yourself that if i do this i get this and you feel a sense of pride and then naturally as humans we often want to improve so then the next day you probably want to go a step further um yeah so i think that's especially important now in ramazan as well because um people normally shift their habits but i think normally obviously there's the element of um the shayateen um, being locked up and whatnot, or the major shayateen being locked up. But there's also the social pressure of Ramazan in terms yeah. of the, the culture, the Rawi Salah, everyone fasting, or at least the Muslims fasting. And I think that pushes people to positively change their habits and routine towards um, like the dini activities. But this time, because there's, it's going to be a different Ramazan, uh, what do you think about how... Muslims can still benefit spiritually from the month and get the benefits that we normally seek um, even if say there aren't these communal activities or that whole vibe of Ramazan might not be there like normal yeah <clears throat> I think what's important um, I've, I've seen some very optimistic Facebook posts online from this is going to be our best Ramadan because we finally can focus on ourselves and such and such. But like you said, is your environment plays a huge role in your motivation, in your success, in the opportunities that you get. And quite practically, I don't know about you, but if I have to recite for myself that away for one and a half hours, uh, I run out of uh, memorization material quite fast. Yeah. So... Um, I think that if you notice that you feel worry, uh, I think that's a very healthy feeling. And it's a good feeling because it's a feeling of Iman and that you know that there's a, a quite realistic danger for the quality of your Ramadan. So I think first, of course, we have to accept this feeling. Of, okay, I'm, I'm a bit worried. I'm going to miss out on Tarawih. Um I'm going to miss out a lot of bonding with my Muslim family, friends, or just people at the mosque. Make dua to Allah uh, that he will safeguard us from this. That's really, really mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Secondly, um, we have to make some, make some proactive steps. So we know that our environment and the people around us, the social pressure, or maybe even better, the social <laughs> uh, calling to the good, yeah. Um, it helps us. So definitely, when we know that we can proactively uh, increase that social interaction, the social control. So what we could do is um, make a WhatsApp group, 
uh, make uh, with friends make a, a, a set point a set date uh, like weekly do weekly gatherings on Zoom or Skype or such so because we are human beings we need social interaction so alhamdulillah it's a big chance because a lot of people especially during Ramadan do a lot of worshipping only in the mosque only only with that social pressure so it's a real challenge for us to do a mm. lot of personal worship what's really mm. important but don't forget that it's not for nothing that Allah created so many communal uh, social acts of worship it's not for nothing that he promotes praying in a mosque that exactly he made a uh, juma oblig obligatory for the man um, mm. you cannot pay zakat without somebody else you cannot mm. give it to <laughs> you have to get so islam is a social and community building religion so um it's going to be difficult accept that so also adjust your uh, expectations and mm. proactively look up uh, the social interaction because they won't come to you um, so you have to come to them so make appointments try to follow online lessons but not only because watching a lecture is not the same as interacting with somebody mm. so i think we really have to look out that we replace acts of worship with like a, i'm going to follow lessons on youtube or watch a lecture or um really try to incorporate some social interaction with other muslims because mm. or else you're really going to uh, uh lose out on some really beneficial uh yeah activities mm. yeah mashallah that's a good point i didn't actually when i was asking you that question i didn't actually think of how you can in a way mimic that social effect by joining or creating these online communities and um, recently i have seen a lot of institutions um, that would normally provide physical classes they have gone online uh, even one of the groups that i study with they've created like a whole um, online portal where they're going to have daily iftar reminders and so i think if people join if people join groups like that it'll benefit them but the difference is this time it's not going to be before, obviously, people go into Ramazan and it's kind of automatic. The whole process just starts. This time, people may have to put in that initial effort themselves yeah, yeah. of actually seeking out the um, that good company. And then the other thing, just to add to that, is you get reward for it. So it, it all goes back. The Muslim's mindset, mindset should obviously be, in a way, protected or bulletproof. We're not talking about clinical problems. We're talking just about the average um kind of feelings and emotions of sadness and lack of motivation and whatnot um you should be protected because it goes back to that thing about everything that be befalls the believer is benefiting or is good for them because if there's something ostensibly good then alhamdulillah that's good in all ways even in the dunya sense if something's ostensibly bad and they bear it with patience or they respond in a positive way then that's still good because one from the stoic perspective they're going to be getting stronger but from the dini perspective they're also getting stronger in terms of their mindset but they're going to get their sins wiped away um, and they get reward for their pace, patience so i think if we view everything from that lens um, i think that's where you can kind of lock in that mindset and always refer back to that you can use affirmations or whatever else to keep reminding yourself of that um what do you think yeah it's it's really beautiful uh, especially the i think what's the hadith right that you quoted yeah. yeah um yeah you're totally right and i want to press again that i, I know a lot of institutions are now offering lessons and and, and reminders and such but listening watching a speaker is not the same as interaction Mm. So, again, and also because we have WhatsApp and we're really used to it, seeing people looking somebody in the eyes um, is not the same like chatting, what uh, using WhatsApp or, or just listening to another somebody else. So, I really would press every Muslim that listens to this, um, plan proactively to video call with other people. 
because sending a reminder, watching a lecture from somebody else, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to look somebody in the eyes because it's so funny. There's uh, there's also studies being done that social isolation and feelings of loneliness often um, creates behavior that isolates yourself even more. So don't wait until you feel lonely to look up interaction because a big chance is that when you start feeling lonely, the motivation of actually looking up companionship gets even lower or it gets harder. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, a, a big thing that people should do, which you normally would happen automatically, but now we have to proactively go after it. Um, and it's not good for, in terms of, correct me if I'm wrong, and one thing I just say is I always like, I see some of your posts and I encourage people to follow you on Instagram or wherever else and we'll try and include those links in the show notes. Um, I like the way you reference studies and um, obviously um, when you're writing it's much easier to kind of do that and link back to the studies. But correct me if I'm wrong, loneliness it affects immunity as well will you not because there's obviously the stress connection but yeah. I, I have read or heard about how in the elderly population loneliness is a kind of a big thing that leads to lower life expectancy but the funny thing is it's not only uh in elderly there was a study done uh, and they showed that uh, loneliness is a bigger predictor of uh dying earlier than smoking uh, or obesity or diabetes so mm. that's and it, and it was somewhat correlated for uh, because you could also think okay maybe it's because when you fall from your stairs and you're alone at home nobody knows that you're falling down but they correlated for that uh, corrected mm. for that so uh, there is like you said you, it, it can lower your immunity okay, we cannot test this hypothesis because you, you, could, you cannot just put <laughs> isolate just you yeah. cannot, it's not ethical. You cannot uh, make people lonely and see what happens. But yeah. um, what we see is that people who feel uh, emotions of loneliness, uh, they, you see uh, inflammation, low-grade inflammation. And we know mm -hmm. that those low-grade chronic inflammations are linked to um, uh, yeah, uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases, um, strokes, depressions, a lot of negative health outcomes. And because it's, and it's quite also because it's logical, because humans are social beings. And for the longest time, um, being lonely was quite dangerous. Because now we live in a, mashallah, a very well developed society that you don't get killed on the street. And uh, basically, if you have money, you can live alone. But, yeah. um, yeah, it used to be very dangerous to be alone in the wilderness, for example. So it's a logical, physiological reaction of your body to be alert and to yeah. increase uh, yeah, your feelings of danger. And it, So it's a very logical reaction, but in this society, and it, this society yeah, it was, doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah, traditionally it was kind of like a imperative or a social yeah. or cultural imperative. But I guess, again, in terms of, say, if someone listening is kind of feeling like that. It goes back to the meta skill of uh, muhasaba or muraqaba, which is like self-reflection or being able to, especially now that we've got this time, you need to be able to monitor your thoughts and you have to try and recognize these um, feelings or emotions because then you can take rectifying action. One of the key concepts that we always talk about, um, optimized Muslim, is growth mindset. So if you have the mindset that you can do, you can learn and you can fix things and which a Muslim should should have, be optimistic. Every problem or perceived problem is just a plan away from a solution. If you yeah. are feeling lonely or then you need to start taking proactive steps, go online, do your research if you need to. But then simply forget the research, just get in touch with people, get in touch with your friends or family. And like you said, try and uh, interact with them. Uh, via video call or whatever else and then it's a it's a experiment that you can do on yourself after the next day you'll probably be feeling better it's not even going to cost you anything and that's the thing with a lot of the steps that we suggest there's no it's not like there's a course or there's some investment that you have to make they're basically little mindset hacks or 
things that anyone's got access to that make a dramatic effect um, on your productivity or well-being or life. So I think um, that's kind of important. And uh, Brother Martin, if there's anything else that you want to talk about, I think that's perhaps a good good place to uh, at least end the first instalment of our conversation. And inshallah, um, going forward, we'll keep having these uh, conversations, inshallah, if people benefit from them. Inshallah. I think a good point to, to remind people from, especially when we talk about loneliness, um, research shows that loneliness, like I said previously, is lo- loneliness can prevent prevents people from doing the necessary steps. Mm. Also because so, uh, you often see that people who feel lonely uh, create behavior that makes it harder for people to interact with them. Mm. They get desperate or clingy or um, they, they feel more pressure when they communicate with people. Mm. Uh, and a lot of people, especially now, I think now it's a good thing to remind people is Feeling lonely is not a it's not failure. It's not like you're not manly or you're weak. It loneliness is a it's really <clears throat> they've done a lot of research on it. Meaningful connection is a basic psychological need. Mm. If you deprive people from it, they get sick and 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 uh, they don't function well. So, mm. like I said, with empathy, realizing that everybody deals sometimes with feelings of loneliness mm. helps you to not feel shame. Yeah. So that's really important. And secondly, um, you can do f- um, things about it. Um, this sh- and also the the Muslim aspect of it of the community building. Um, it's not only egoistical, like I don't want to be lonely. If you don't feel lonely now, realize that probably during this lockdown, a lot of people are feeling lonely and they mm. are deprived from the amount of social interaction that they would like. So yeah. um, to protect yourself and also if you don't get harmed, but you still want to help others, still reach out with people. And like I said, try to uh, incorporate as much communication as you can possibly have. And that the, the highest now we can do is like video call because video calling is not the same as audio calling and audio calling is not the same as just sending a text message. Mm. But um, also s- studies have shown that doing um, selfless acts uh, of helping other other people really improves your, um, basically your, your, your emotional and mental uh, health and yeah. wellness. So it, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel good, uh, yeah. and and those effects uh, lasted for quite a while, surprisingly. So, um, don't be ashamed. You're not a fa- you're not failing. You're just somebody who needs a social mm. interaction, and now you're being tr- everybody is deprived from it. Mm. Uh, and if you don't battle with it, please know that a lot of people will probably be battling with it. So uh, reach out, you know. Yeah, mashallah. You know what? Um, just hearing you speak, I can feel. It's a good balance because I know I went on my little rant about how people need to recognize it and take action. It can come across sometimes as, like you said, the empathy element. So I can I can sense that you would make or you are a kind of a good coach, but um, there's always more nuance to it. Yeah. Generally, <clears throat> excuse me, this advice is more... You can't go into the nuances of genetics and how some people are naturally going to be more introverted or they might not like reaching out to people. They might have gone through traumas um, that make them react to people differently. So there's a whole host of reasons, um, environmental or how they've been brought up or genetic, that could kind of make things more difficult for people. So obviously we make dua that. Allah, if people are going through whatever problems and issues people are going through, um, Allah makes it easy for everyone. Uh, I mean, but um, um, I just like to say Jazakallah khairan for your time. I know there was a, a bit of a, in terms of organizing this, it was, I made it a bit difficult for you. <laughs> so, uh, no inshallah, going forward, I appreciate that you decided to support this podcast at this early stage. And um, inshallah, one day, um, both our projects might be able to work together in a meaningful way for the Ummah and everyone. So, um, Jazakallah Khairan and um, 
Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If this content makes you think, you find it beneficial, it improves your deen and life in any way, as a favor I ask that you make dua for the success of this project. It's small at present and just myself, but I have a vision for it, alhamdulillah. Secondly, I'd ask that you share a screenshot on your social media or better yet, send it to that one friend that you know thinks in a similar manner and would benefit. If you guide someone towards a good action, you get the reward of that action. And in doing so, we can benefit from one of the positives of this hyper-connected social media world in what I call the good deed multiplier effect. Please also rate the podcast on whatever listening platform you use so it's promoted to more people, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.